Um, uh, the next speaker is Trevor Godspeed, Goodspeed. He's uh, come all the way from Tennessee to tell you how to, well, manipulate medical devices. Well, you're not supposed to do that, of course. Uh, but despite the somewhat uh, daunting title, I think we're going to learn quite a bit about microcontrollers that are used in, for example, medical equipment. Uh, and don't be uh, shy because of the part two. Part one was uh, given at the Black Hat conference, uh, but I think uh, whoever missed out part one uh, won't regret it. So let's first thank Trevor for coming over. Uh, howdy. Uh, my name is Travis Good. Can we turn that down just a bit? <laughs> Hello? Okay, that's better. So, in part one, I described a theoretical attack against the MSP430 microcontroller, which is a 16 bit chip with a computer contained entirely within it. You give it stable power and you can put a program into the chip and it runs it, just as a larger computer would, um, except that it's embedded, you can throw it on a board and such. Since then, I've actually gotten it to work in hardware. I've broken a chip with it and I've, um, I've built this little device for attacking the chip. Some versions are vulnerable, some versions aren't. The, uh, the basis of the attack, though, is in the timing of a password comparison. If you look at this waveform on the title slide, the left is an acknowledgement telling the attacker that it's okay to transmit. Between the two signals, the attacker is giving a, a password guess, and he's doing it with non-standard serial timing. Then the right waveform is the victim telling the attacker that the password is wrong and that he's not going to be given access to protected memory. By using non-standard timing, the, you can make it such that the only thing affecting the difference between these two waveforms, that's like the end of the first and the beginning of the second, is how correct the password guess is. And you can make this distance vary by two clock cycles per correct byte of your guess. So if you guess all zeros and it happens, say, six clock cycles faster than uh, an impossible password would be, then you know that the byte zero occurs three times within the password. So you can run through all of the bytes, you can figure out how many times they each occur, and then you can go back and uh, you, you then have the alphabet of the password. So you'll then have 32 or fewer potential letters to try and then you just rotate them through until you get the entire thing. Um, so I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a neighborly town. I'll soon be moving to Philadelphia, which is not quite so neighborly. I authored the first stack overflow for the MSP430. I maintain the reverse engineering tool, MSP430 Static, which is the only presently maintained tool for taking apart this um, firmware for this chip. I reverse engineered the EZ430 in circuit debugger, which I'll be giving a lecture on in two days, a traffic light controller and the bootstrap loader, uh, of which we'll be speaking. And lately I've been experimenting with voltage glitching and uh, non-cryptography related power analysis, uh, some of which you'll see at the end of these slides. The device that I'll be discussing cracks MSP430 bootstrap loader passwords only on vulnerable versions, which are those beneath 1.6 and above 2.01. Um, so the older chips and then the brand new ones. Um, for example, the 4618 and the 1101A are both vulnerable. The 4618 is um, like a top-of-the-line chip with more than um, 16 bits of memory space. It has an LCD controller, tons of I.O. The 1101A is an uh, modern remake of one of their original chips. Um, and this vulnerability was first disclosed at Black Hat USA. 
So this is an example board that we might be attacking. We've got a um, 4618 there in the middle and to the left of the board. It controls the LCD at the top. Um, this is a serial port and some analog chains and that sort of stuff. Uh, usually when you program this board, you use JTAG or spy-by-wire. And in the case of uh, JTAG, you connect to the board and there's a physical fuse that can lock you out. If you're not locked out, you have complete control of memory, you can debug the device, you can single step it, you can read from memory, write from memory, and there's no concept of a password. Uh, but this is all implemented in hardware. You have an actual state machine, you shift into registers and you shift out of registers, and there's no software implementing this within the chip. An alternative is to use a bootstrap loader. Uh, it's only intended for programming, not for debugging. The closest it has to debugging features is the ability to jump to a pointer or to read from memory. You can't single step, um, but at the same time, it has a password protection mechanism that's independent of the JTAG fuse protection. So if you blow the JTAG fuse, you can still access the chip through its serial port. Um, further, this is code within memory. It's always from C100 to uh, 1000 hex. You can dump it, you can debug it, you can disassemble it, you can analyze it, and it has bugs. I mean, it's only 500 words long, but even at that length, it still has bugs. So there are the different commands that you can use with it. Um, you can receive data, and that means that you're telling the board to receive, the victim to receive it data. You can tell it to receive a password, you can erase memory, you can erase all of memory, you can um, like see whether or not memory has been erased, and all, all of these things. But only the ones on the right column can be accessed without a password. And some, like the change baud command, now require a password in more modern versions. Um, and the reason for this is that if you could tell it to transmit data to you, then you could just have it transmit the password. Or you could dump a copy of the firmware of the chip and then start making counterfeit boards. So you, um, commercially, if one firm got a board that belonged to a competitor, instead of spending the time to design it from scratch, they can just photographically copy the PCB layout and then if not for the protection mechanisms, it could also copy out the firmware, load that firmware into the new board, and sell it as if it were their own. And by changing the board layout and keeping only the firmware the same, it can become difficult to prove that your competitor has stolen your firmware. Um, and uh, also worth mentioning is that the change baud rate uh, command doesn't actually change the baud rate. It actually changes the clock rate. Uh, we'll get into how it figures out uh, serial timing, but it, in some versions you can change the baud rate to something very high, actually setting the clock very high, and then you can brute force passwords faster. Now, conveniently, those are the ones that my timing attack does not work against. So this is my first attempt at a cracking device. Uh, all through whole parts, a very low powered MSP430 in the middle. And with this device, I verified the behavior, but I never actually broke a board. The following version shown here uses surface mount components. Uh, this one is shown partially soldered. And this is the first to actually extract uh, a password from a board. Uh, since then, I've manufactured the BSLC 3.0, which adds voltage glitching and uh, a third button. Uh, the fourth one will have two serial ports and some other enhancements. Now, uh, to start the BSL, because keep in mind this is a microcontroller, it has no innate operating system. Uh, usually, you turn the microcontroller on by raising the reset pin from zero to one. And if your test pin remains grounded throughout that, then the user program will begin. 
if you send two pulses, and sometimes this is backward on another pin, um, if you send two pulses and the second pulse falls just after the reset line goes high, then instead of pushing the reset vector into the program counter, it pushes um, a vector found within permanent mass ROM. So usually the chip will look at uh, 0x, f, 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 e, take those 16 bits and push them into the program counter. By doing it this way, it instead looks at 0x, 0c, 0, 0, 2. Um, and then on different chips, you do different lines. Now, um, so looking at a scope, you can see the, the timing. And once you initialize it, it's waiting for uh, 0x80 to be sent across because it needs to figure out the timing with which it's going to speak. Um, and then you can view the conversation as bytes going across the wire between the two chips. And I'm going to refer to bytes as packets because that's uh, sort of how things work. Each one begins on a falling edge. After the falling edge, you've got um, your data bits, and then you have a single even parity bit to make the number of ones even. And then you have a stop bit, which is always high. When you do this, and you give it the password comparison command, it runs through code that might look like this. And this is the invulnerable version. There's a comparison above the top. It comes down into the uh, conditional jump instruction. This either goes left or right. If it goes left, you see a uh, NOP instruction and a jump. Neither of these does anything except make sure that it gets to the end and that it does it at the same time as it would take if it went the right route. On the right route, it runs a bit immediate set, which disables access to the password protected regions. Following this, there's a jump, again, keeping the timing balanced. So then at the end, six clock cycles have passed, whichever direction you went. Other versions look like this. You have a conditional jump, which goes straight to the end of the comparison. And then you have a bit immediate set. And if the bit is set, if that byte of the password is wrong, it takes four clock cycles instead of two. So you have a difference of two in your comparison. And this code is run once for each byte of the password. So the password is 32 bytes, 256 bits. This code executes 32 times. So I loaded this into a simulator. I wrote a simple firmware image, which has a simple password. You just have an entry and then a for loop. The for loop calls the password comparison routine. And the idea is to run the routine for uh, a guess of each of the 256 unique bytes. So we'll try all zeros, we'll try all ones, all twos, all threes. And then we compare the total run times. So in this case, three choices of bytes ran faster than the others. So 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, all of the bytes which don't exist in our password take 6,543 clock cycles. 0, 0, 1, 1, 3a, they all take less than that. And if we divide the difference in clock cycles by 2, then we see that there will be one instance of 0, 0. 16 instances of 11 hex, and 15 instances of 3a. And sure enough, this is our password. And the password isn't chosen by the uh, programmer. The password is the list of interrupt vector entry points. <laughs> and there's a good reason for that, too, because if, I mean, when you're making a product, you're just trying to ship it out the door. And in an ideal world, it would be different, but that's how the vast majority of engineering firms work. And you don't have time to look into the security of each device. You don't have time to choose a good 